Hi everyone, my name is Beth. I'm a librarian at the Wyenberg Library in Mequon, and I'm here today to talk with you about some smartphone basics. So I'm going to talk about both Android phones and iPhones. I have this presentation set up so you can see my Android phone on the right over here, and then I'll have screenshots of iPhone in this PowerPoint presentation. I should mention that everything I'm going to talk about is based on specific versions of the Apple operating system for iPhone and the Android operating system for pretty much all other phones. So depending on what kind of phone you have, some of these things may be different. Um, my hope is that by the end of this, you have a general sense of how phones work and where you might go to find different settings and things that you want to use on your phone. But if you have questions, um, I'm always happy to try to answer them even remotely. Uh, my contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation, so feel free to get in touch. Um, I will take you through generally how phones work, some of the settings you can use to get them to work and sound the way you want them to. I'll talk about how you can make phone calls, manage your contacts, go online, and download and manage apps. The handouts for both iPhones and Android phones are also linked in the description below, so feel free to take a look at those. And without any further ado, let's get started. The two major phone operating systems are iOS, which runs the iPhone, and Android, which runs pretty much everything else. If you have an iPhone, you're using iOS, and if you have a Samsung, an LG, an HTC, whatever, then you're running Android. There are differences between the two different operating systems, um, but by and large, they have the same key features and functions. So you can make calls, you can go online, download apps, and so on. All smartphones have touch screens, which may or may not have given you some trouble in the past. Typically, there are three movements that touch screens respond to, tapping, swiping, and holding down. So when you tap on something, make sure you're doing so as light and fast as possible, and do it with the tip of your finger, not the flat of it, and not the nail. The longer you hold down or the harder you tap, the more likely your phone is to become confused. So do your best to keep as light and fast as you can. It does take practice. Um, every time I get a new phone, I have to learn all over again how to make the touch screen work the way that I want it to. So if it feels awkward at first, just Give yourself some time to get used to it. It will get better. Swiping is a similar idea. Again, light and fast motions with the tip of your finger, not the flat, not the nail. Swiping lets you move back and forth between screens or parts of an app. And then holding down on an app or part of your screen or anywhere else on your phone um, will trigger a menu of some kind to open. So for example, if I tap and hold down on my camera, I get a menu where I can jump in and take a video, take a selfie or take a portrait. Um, I can also move the camera around the screen if I kind of drag it back and forth and I can let it go and let it drop down to where I want it to be. Um, I will talk more about moving apps and stuff around later, uh, but generally holding down gives you extra options to interact with apps and other parts of your phone. All phones open to a home screen, which looks a little bit like this on an iPhone. The person whose phone I used for these screenshots has her apps sorted into folders, but you're more likely to see all of your apps listed all over the screen and even across multiple screens. Android also has a home screen, um, but you'll only see some apps here. Apps that you choose, apps that the phone decides are important, um, and you can add more as you need to, and you can also add them across multiple screens just like with the iPhone. You can find all of your apps on an Android phone in your app tray, which you access by swiping up from the bottom of the screen. And then all of your apps are here and they're listed alphabetically. Um, so you can tap on any of them to go ahead and jump into them. Once you're into a different part of the phone, be that your settings, your app tray, you can get back out of it and back to the home screen by tapping the home button, which on an Android phone is right down here at the bottom of the screen. So if I tap on that, it takes me back to where I started. On an iPhone, um, there will be an actual physical button on the bottom of the phone underneath the screen that you push to get back home. If you have a newer iPhone, you may not have a home screen at all. Um, Apple recently took away the home button on newer models to make more room for the, the actual touch screen, but you can add it back. Um, I've put instructions for how to do that in the iPhone handout, so feel free to take a look at that. 
Now I have been talking about apps. For those of you who aren't sure what those are, app is short for the word application. And it basically refers to any kind of software that's installed on your phone that allows you to do something, complete a task, go somewhere, read something. So for example, you have a phone app on both the iPhone and the Android phone that lets you make phone calls. You have various mail apps that let you look at your email. You have apps that will let you read books like Libby. Um, there's a ton of different apps out there and I will talk more about how to get them and how to sort them and where to put them. Um, but that is what that word specifically means. So next I want to talk about your settings. Um, so your phone comes with certain things turned on and set up in a certain way by default, but you are not at the mercy of those settings. You can go in and change how your phone looks, what it sounds like, what it does when you do certain things. To get to your settings on an iPhone, you would tap on what looks like a gray gear symbol like this. And on an Android phone, you would tap on a green settings gear, which is usually somewhere on this home screen. If it isn't, you can find it in your app tray again by swiping up from the bottom of the screen and jumping down to the S's for settings. And then tapping on the settings will get you into the menu. So the menu looks different in iOS versus Android, but they do cover the same sorts of features. Um, and I'm going to go through some of those features pretty quickly here. My hope is that I can introduce you to each of these things and then you'll feel empowered to go through and, and kind of play with them yourselves and turn things on and off as, as you want to experiment with them. Um, so I'm not going to get too far into the weeds. I just want to give you kind of an overview. And again, if you are looking at your phone and it doesn't look like what I'm talking about, um, that's okay. A lot of these things are things that came up in older versions of phones, but they were called something different or they were sorted differently. Hopefully they're consistent enough that you can find your way around, but if not, again, reach out and I'll be happy to try to give you a hand. So one of the first things that you have control over in your settings menu is how your phone sounds. The sound it makes when someone calls you, when someone texts you, how loud that sound is, whether or not it should make a sound at all or it should just vibrate or be silent. On an iPhone, you control that by going into either sounds or sounds and haptics, depending on how new your phone is. On an Android phone, instead, you go to sound. On an iPhone, the menu looks like this. On Android, it looks like this. So again, you can decide whether or not your phone should make any noise at all, what sorts of noises it should make, how loud they should be, a whole bunch of stuff. Next up, you can change the way your phone looks. You can change how big the fonts are, how bright the screen is, what color certain menus should be. You can even change the wallpaper on your home screen. So you may have seen I have a picture of my dog. Um, you can set different photos, you can set different patterns, all kinds of stuff. On an iPhone, you go into either display and brightness or wallpaper to do that. And then on an Android phone instead, you're going to go to display. Again, you can change the brightness here, we can change the wallpaper, we can change text sizes and different settings like that. When it comes to brightness, keep in mind that the brighter your phone is, the easier the, the screen is to read, um, but the faster your battery is going to drain. Having that screen turned up really bright will, will have an effect on how long you can use your phone for without needing to plug it in. That's the trade-off with brightness. Brighter is easier to see, but has an effect on your battery. And next I want to talk about the internet. Um, you connect to the internet on your phone using either Wi-Fi or data, which is a cellular internet connection that your cell provider actually gives you. So on the iPhone, to get to Wi-Fi, you would tap on Wi-Fi, and then the Android actually keeps the Wi-Fi and data settings under network and internet. So if we tap on that, I can see Wi-Fi and mobile network. I'm going to tap on Wi-Fi because we're going to start there. So Wi-Fi is an internet connection provided by the internet service provider wherever you are. So if you walk into a coffee shop um, or an airport or somewhere and your phone says, hey, there's a Wi-Fi network here, that means that that location is providing you an internet connection that you can use. Wi-Fi can either be open to everyone, so you can just jump in, or it can be password protected which means you either have to ask for the password or you have to know the password to get online. To tell if your Wi-Fi is on, once you've tapped on it, on an iPhone you would look at this toggle over here. 
The green means that it's activated. If you tapped this toggle, it would turn gray, which would mean that it was off. Similarly, on the Android, this green means that I am on. If I tap on this, it'll turn off. Generally, you'll see a list of different Wi-Fi networks that are available. If you see a little padlock, that means that they have a password and you would need to enter that password to join them. Otherwise, you can just tap on the network and your phone will try to connect. If you tap on a network and there's a password required, you'll see a pop-up box that comes up that says, okay, give me the password. And once you've entered it, you'll be able to get online. You'll also be able to tell because on the iPhone, there'll be a little check mark next to one of the networks indicating that you're online. And over on the Android side, you'll see it'll say connected underneath whatever network you're connected to. So that's Wi-Fi. The other option that you have to get online is data. And data, like I said, is provided by your actual cell phone company. And they may or may not charge you based on how much you use. It just depends on what provider you have and what their rules are in their contract. So on an iPhone, again, to get to your data settings, you'd go into settings and tap on cellular. On Android, you go into network and internet and then tap on mobile network. To turn it on, you would tap the toggle next to cellular data. On an iPhone, when it's green, that means it's on. Android, same thing. There's a toggle over here. I can tap on that and turn it on, which I will do now. So now it's green, and you can see that means that my data is on. When it comes to Wi-Fi versus data, because data can sometimes cause your cell phone provider to charge penalties for using too much of it, it's generally best to use Wi-Fi as much as possible. If you leave your Wi-Fi signal on, your phone will consistently try to find open Wi-Fi networks for you to join and use whenever you're moving around outside or sitting at home. If there's no network nearby, you can then use data instead to kind of bridge the gap. So if you have Wi-Fi at home, you'd be puttering around the house, you're playing music on your phone, you're um, going online to look stuff up, you're using your Wi-Fi connection, that's great. Then you leave the house, you want to go to the airport because you're leaving for a trip. While you're in the car, you're probably not going to be able to get a Wi-Fi connection anywhere because you're moving too fast and your phone won't have time to connect to a network, much less stay in that network because it won't be able to keep the signal. So while you're in the car, if you want to be listening to music or using Google Maps to get directions to the airport, you probably need to have your data on. But then once you get to the airport, you can turn your data off and connect to the airport's Wi-Fi network and use their Wi-Fi until you get on the plane. Does that make sense? So use Wi-Fi when you can, but when you can't, if you need to be online, then use data. The other thing I would mention when it comes to Wi-Fi is that if you are out in public and you connect to a Wi-Fi network that doesn't have a password, that network is considered not secure which means that someone could potentially see information you send over that network. So if you go to a coffee shop and they have an open Wi-Fi and you connect, and then you go to Amazon.com and you say, I want to buy this, and you type in your credit card number and submit your order, someone sitting in that shop, if they knew what they were doing, could see your credit card number zooming sort of through the Wi-Fi signal to Amazon. And then they could take that number and use it for themselves. So if you're out in public and you're using a public Wi-Fi network that doesn't have a password, don't do anything on your phone that you wouldn't want someone looking over your shoulder while you're doing it. The next thing I want to talk about is location, which on the iPhone is in your settings under privacy and then location services. On an Android phone, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. You want to go down to location, tap on that. And then just like on an iPhone, you would tap this toggle right up here and this bar will turn green and then you'll know that your location is on. You'll also see a little icon near the top of the screen that looks sort of like a little compass mark. You might need to use location for different services like Google Maps. So if you use the Maps app on your phone to get you directions to a place that you're going, your phone needs to know where you are in order to give you those directions. So you have to have the location on in that case in order to use that app. If you don't have your location on when you open an app that requires it, the app will ask you permission to activate it. And if you say yes, it'll go ahead and turn it on for you. 
It won't turn it off when you're done though. So if you don't wanna keep your location on for whatever reason, either because you're not comfortable with your phone knowing where you are, or because you find out that using your location drains your battery, which it might, you would have to come in here and manually turn your location off every time you use an app that uses it. Um, I personally keep my location off because it does drain my battery pretty fast. I've noticed that when I use apps like Google Maps and I have my data and my location running at the same time, I lose battery life like extremely fast. Like I'll go from 100% to 50% over the course of using it for a couple of hours. So I keep mine off, but whether or not you keep yours off is completely up to you. Next, I wanna talk about security. On the iPhone, it's either under touch ID and passcode or face ID and passcode, depending on how new your phone is. On an Android phone, you would go into security. In these security menus, you have quite a few different security options to choose from. Personally, I don't know about all of them, so if you are curious about any of them, you're not quite sure what they are. Um, for Apple products, for iPhones, you could always go up to the Apple Store or give them a call and they can explain it. For your Android phone, your local cell phone company can explain it. So if you are with AT&T, you go into an AT&T store, give them a call, they should be able to talk you through these different options. The ones I can tell you about are the device security and sort of screen lock options, which you have access to on both an iPhone and an Android phone. You can set up your phone so that anytime you turn on the screen and go in to use an app, you'll be asked for a PIN or to draw a particular pattern or put in a particular password. You can also set it up where it requires that you put in your fingerprint or that it take a picture of your face to prove that you are who you say you are, which is a good way to keep your phone secure. If you ever leave your phone somewhere or someone steals it, you might not think it's a big deal, but if you consider that you might be logged in, for example, to your bank account on your phone, you might be logged into Amazon or some other account with your credit card attached to it or your debit card attached to it, if someone gets a hold of your phone, they've also gotten a hold of that information now. So it's a good idea to keep these devices secure by setting up at least a screen lock or some kind of other password to keep folks out if they try to get in. And then last, I wanna talk about accessibility. So on the iPhone, accessibility settings are under either general and then accessibility if you have a slightly older phone or just under accessibility in the regular settings menu. On an Android phone, near the bottom of the list here where we see security and location, accessibility is right here. And these accessibility features are really pretty nice. So on an older iPhone, it looks like this. Newer ones look like this. And then this is the Android menu. So you can see there's lots of different options to make your phone easier to read and interact with generally. So you can change colors, increase the font size, turn on magnifiers so you can make things bigger. You can set things up so that your phone will read speech to you or so that you can speak to your phone to get it to do things. And you can change the way that your touch screen works so that it's a little bit easier to get around and a little bit easier for you to use it. So if you have a hard time with your touch screen in particular, playing around with the accessibility features might be a good idea. With accessibility, and with your phone settings more generally, I really encourage you to experiment. Um, your phone is designed to be indestructible in every way except for the screen. So short of dropping it, you're not gonna do anything that will break it. If you're nervous about not remembering what you did and then not remembering how to turn something off, if it turns out you don't like it, you can take notes as you go. So say, okay, I'm gonna go into this settings feature, I'm gonna turn this on and then see what it does. And then you know how to get back to where you were to turn it off if you have to. But the best way really to learn about these settings and learn what you like is to mess around. Personally, it's my favorite part of getting a new phone is going into the settings and seeing what's new and seeing what I can turn on and turn off to make it work the way I want it to. And sometimes I don't even know what the way I want it to is until I've played around a little bit. So now let's talk about making phone calls. Um, for all the cool features that your smartphone has, it is also just a phone, and you can use it to make calls just like any other phone. To do that, you actually have to use your phone's phone app, um, which on the iPhone you get to by tapping on the green phone icon, usually somewhere at the bottom of your screen, and on the Android you'd get to it by tapping on the blue phone icon. Now you'll notice 
Now that I've tapped on the phone button, on my Android phone, I'm actually seeing a list of my contacts. And that's because by tapping on the phone icon on either an iPhone or an Android phone, you're actually opening the phone app, which contains not only a keypad and a dial pad for you to type in new numbers, but also lets you access things like recent calls, favorites, so people that you call very often, and of course your list of contacts and your voicemail. On an iPhone, if you open up your phone app and it opens to your favorites, your recents, your contacts, or your voicemail, you can tap on keypad to get to this dial pad. On an Android phone, you would tap on this blue circle and that will open up the dial pad for you instead. To get to your contacts on an iPhone, you can always open up the phone app and then tap contacts at the bottom of the screen. On an Android phone, you have two different options. One is to find and tap on the blue contacts button, which you might get to on your home screen or which might be in your app tray, which you access by swiping up from the bottom of the screen. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, in your app tray, it's right here under C for contacts. So you could just tap on it. Once you've tapped on the contact button, this is what the contacts list looks like on the iPhone and the Android phone. So they're arranged alphabetically. To add a new contact on an iPhone, you would tap the plus symbol near the top right corner. And on an Android phone, you would instead tap on create new contact. To edit a contact or to call them, you would tap on their name. And then for editing on an iPhone, you would tap edit near the top right corner. On an Android phone, you would tap edit contact near the bottom right corner. To call them, on an iPhone, you would tap on the little phone icon. On an Android phone, you'd tap on call. And then to delete a contact, on an iPhone, you're gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom of the screen and then tap on delete contact. On an Android phone, in the top right corner of the screen, you'll tap on these three dots, which opens up a menu, and then you can say delete to actually delete the contact completely. So now let's talk about accessing the internet. So earlier we talked about how to get online using Wi-Fi and data. Again, you're gonna go into your settings um, and choose to activate either a Wi-Fi network or your cellular data, depending on where you are and what you have access to. And then if you wanted to go online and do things like look at your email, look up a library book, pretty much anything you wanted to do on your computer, you can do that on your phone by going into an internet browsing app, which on the iPhone, the default is Safari. And on the Android, the default is Chrome, which I have in my app tray right here. Once you tap on either of these apps, you'll get two screens that look very much like their versions on the computer. You can search for the answers to questions, go to sites and order things, check your bank account, go to the library catalog. But again, be careful if you're on a public Wi-Fi network that you don't do anything that might be too revealing to someone who might be kind of snooping over your shoulder. As you go around the internet, you may encounter certain websites that recommend that you download their app rather than just using their website on your phone. So for example, I have a Hotmail account for my personal email, and every time I go to hotmail.com on my phone, I get a pop-up that says, hey, did you know we have an app now? It's nicer and easier to use. And that may be true, but I don't use email on my phone all that often, so I've never downloaded the app, but I could. And the way to do that would be to go into the App Store on an iPhone or the Play Store on my Android phone. So on an iPhone, you would be looking for this icon. And then on an Android phone, the Play Store is going to be right here, this sideways arrow. And tapping on these will open up the app and the Play Store. So if you wanted to just browse and see what was out there, um, you can choose various options in the menus down at the bottom of the screen. So there's games, there's different apps, like social media apps and all kinds of different stuff. Um, there's movies and TV shows and books to download and things like that. Um, so again, if you just wanna play around, you can get started with that in these menus down here. If you wanna look for something specific, on the iPhone, you would tap the magnifying glass down in the bottom right corner. On the Android, you'd instead tap into the search bar up near the top of the screen. Now I am going to type in Libby again. I'm going to search for our ebook app here at the library. And as I type in the word Libby, 
there's some drop downs here of suggested matches that I might be referring to. So I could tap on any of these to go ahead and see what they are, or I can tap search on the iPhone or the magnifying glass on my Android to go ahead and finish the search and see what results I get. This is what the results page looks like. So I do have Libby here. This is what I want. There are other results though, so you can scroll through and see if the first result isn't what you want. You can skip it and try something else. If I tap on Libby, I can see more about the app. So it'll tell me what's new. It'll give me a preview of what it looks like, how it works. Now in both the iPhone here and in my phone, you can see that these buttons say open. That's because both my coworker and I have already installed Libby. If you haven't installed the app you're looking at, on the iPhone you'll instead see the word get, and when you tap on that then you'll see the word install, and then if you tap on that you might be prompted to um, type in your passcode or push the fingerprint button or do your face ID or it might just start downloading. Same thing on the Android, you'd say install instead of get, and then you might be prompted to verify who you are, um, and then the app will start installing. Once it's done, you can just tap open to dive right in, but if you don't want to go in this way, um, you can also find it on your phone and tap on it to use it. So on the Android phone, remember, the app will wind up in my app tray, which I can get to by swiping upward from the bottom of the screen. And again, they're organized alphabetically, so there is Libby right down there under L. On the iPhone instead, your apps are going to wind up scattered across various screens, including your home screen. You can see that my coworker here has her Libby app sorted into a read folder, which makes it easier to find, but you're much more likely to just kind of see it somewhere on the screen or even on another screen, and you may have to swipe left or right to look for it. When you find it, if you tap on it, it will open. Now, just because an app winds up in one particular place doesn't mean that it has to stay there. So if you know you're going to use Libby all the time and you want to be able to move her over so she's right on that first screen when you turn on your iPhone, you can tap and hold down on her. A little menu will pop up that says Edit Home Screen. If you tap on that, all of your apps will start to shiver. And then you can tap and hold down on Libby and drag her to the left or right until the screen switches over to what you want to see. And then when you let go, she'll land wherever you put her. Now that's hard to visualize, but luckily it works pretty much the same on the Android. So I'm going to show you how that works on mine. So I'm going to tap and hold down on Libby, and I've got another menu that opens up here, and I'm going to pull up from the bottom of the screen toward the top. And you can see it's, it's dropped me back onto my home screen. So I could drag her around and drop her anywhere, or I can pull her to the edge of the screen to switch to another screen. So I can decide between my base home screen or this other screen that I have off to one side. Once I've chosen a screen, I can pull her anywhere I'd like, and when I let go, she'll drop down and sit there until I move her again. So it works pretty much the same on the iPhone. If you want to delete an app, on the iPhone, once you've held down on an app and tapped Edit Home Screen and they've all started shivering, you'll see this X in the top left corner of the app's icon. Tapping on that X will bring up a prompt where the iPhone will say, oh, did you want to delete this? And you can say yes, and then the app will disappear. On an Android phone, you can uninstall apps and you can remove them from your home screen without deleting them. So if I decided I don't want Libby to sit here in the middle of my screen anymore, I can tap and hold down on her, and then I can pull her to the top of the screen over this remove button, and when I let go, She'll disappear from the screen, but if I go back into my app tray, you can see she's still right down here. If I wanted to get rid of her completely, I could tap and hold down on her, pull her to the top of the screen over this uninstall button, and when if I let go, I'll be asked, are you sure? Which I'm not, I don't actually want to uninstall this app. If I did, I would say okay, but I don't, so I'm gonna say cancel. And if I'd said okay, she would disappear from the app tray and be gone. Once you've uninstalled an app, it is uninstalled more or less permanently. It deletes it completely so you can't like go to a recycling bin and restore it. You would have to go back into the App Store or Play Store and re-download the app. So that is it. That is the whole smartphone spiel. 
Again, um, there's a handout for iPhones and a handout for Android phones. Both are linked in the description below. Feel free to download those, print those out, share them with other people. If you have questions for me, feel free to get in touch with me through my email address, elampp at flwlib.org. If you're interested in other programs that we'll be offering through this YouTube channel and through Facebook for the next month or so, you can go to our website, flwlib.org, and then you're going to mouse over Programs and Events near the top of the screen and click on Virtual Library Programs. And you'll be able to see what we've already done, including links to those videos directly, as well as things that are coming up like genealogy classes, arts and crafts, other presentations, cooking demos, all sorts of stuff. Thank you for joining me. I hope that this was helpful, and I will see you next time.